On the other side of the Channel, the British government interned any Germans on British soil in the first few weeks of the war. Cambridge undergraduate Anatole von der Paalen was anti-Nazi, but a German nonetheless. Having spent weeks held behind fences in Britain, he was put on the Arundora Star to be shipped to Canada. At 6 a.m. on the 3rd of July 1940, the ship was hit by a torpedo from a German U-boat. It was a rather nasty bank crash, so we just uh, dashed upstairs up to the top deck and the boat was slightly at a slant and uh, all, all the lifeboats had gone. And then I looked sort of on one side, um, there was, uh, the, there was a, a lifeboat being lowered, but it swung outwards, sucked in 20, 30 heads swimming there, and then came back and squashed them all against the side of the ship. And they went on doing that. So I didn't think that was a very good idea to do it on there. And then, this was silly, see, nobody had told us that when you put on life bells, which we had, um, you've got to hold them from the top down, because when you hit the water, it comes up and hits you under the jaw, and then that breaks your neck. And I was watching these all these you know, floating past with uh, broken decks. Uh, that didn't seem a very good idea either, really. So I found a long piece of rope at the very front, at the sharp end, you know, and uh, slowly let, let myself down into the water. And there was swimming around in my pyjamas and shoes on, of course, uh, and just paddled off and then uh, went down. The evening before I'd been in introduced to an account something or other, and then next morning we were swimming along, he passed me pushing his attaché case with his nose, and the, the conversation was quite uh, incredible because we, I, we only later thought about it and laughed. He sort of waved his hand and said, good morning, Baron. I said, good morning, Count. Uh, cold day for a swim, isn't it, Baron? Yes, it is, rather, Count. Well, so long, Count, so long, Baron. And off we went. The Arundora Star started her voyage with 1,190 internees. Eight hours after the torpedo hit, more than half were dead. Suddenly we saw two little uh, spots on the horizon. They came closer and closer and it was two Canadian destroyers, which was about eight hours late. I mean, we were swimming around for a bit. And, but they were covered in oil, of course. That saved us because oil seeped out of the ship and covered, uh, and, and that kept one dry, warm, not dry, but warmer certainly. Eventually I came up to the ship and there was this net hanging down to the foot. I never know how I went up there, but I was up with like a shot. And at the top were two Canadian sailors, and as you got off the net onto the, on board, one stuck a lit cigarette into your mouth and the other gave a, a, a mug of rum. And that was very good. The Canadian destroyers took the survivors to Greenock in Scotland. We were put into a big, um, I don't know, warehouse or something. And then, it was really quite touching, um, at the windows, little women sort of started to come uh, with little pots in their hand. And it was soup. And I was talking to her, and I said, look, I'm, we're German, I mean, we, we, you know. Yes, but we're in Greenock, our husbands or sons are sailors, and we just hope somebody else will do it for them too. Sailors and their ships may have been key components in the history of warfare up to this point. But in July 1940, with only the English Channel protecting the British from the forces of Nazi Germany, Hitler decided that, in order to invade Britain, his first requirement was supremacy, not at sea, but in the air. The Battle of Britain was about to begin.
In July 1940, the German army was just 22 miles from Britain, held back only by the English Channel. Hitler wanted peace with the British, but before he could achieve it, he had to wait for their nerve to crack. This had worked in Czechoslovakia, and he'd tried it again, if unsuccessfully, in Poland. But British morale was high after their success in rescuing their troops from Dunkirk, and they believed they could stand up to the Germans. On the 17th of July, Hitler accepted that, with Churchill as leader, Britain would never surrender. Realizing he'd have to fulfill his threats, Hitler called a meeting with von Keitel, his chief of staff. Hitler ordered von Keitel to invade Britain, and he, his words were before the 15th of September, because the waters around Britain were very awkward at that time. But also, he got this slightly wrong. He said that there were, there were the fog conditions, but the one qualification was as long as we have the Luftwaffe have supremacy in the air. Having decided on invasion, Hitler retired to his mountain retreat. The heads of the German forces agreed that the invasion would be possible only after the British spirit had been broken. Everything depended on the Luftwaffe. Goering was delighted, believing that his air force could conquer Britain on its own. His pilots shared that confidence. We had thought that after the breakdown of France, or the victory over France, the crisis... We had thought that with the collapse of France, or victory over France, that the war would be over. That England would be so tough and so ready to go to war. We hadn't expected that. Immerhin, dann, dann kam es so weit und dann wurden auch eben Einsätze nach England geflogen. Göring sent waves of bombers with fighter escorts from the coast of France to bomb British airfields believing they'd pulverize the British into submission. It was a hundred plus, uh, you know, they were all stacking up. Uh, they started about 6,000 feet, then there's a squadron, squadron, squadron like that, either bombers or fighters. And I thought, you know, we're not going to survive this. When you got in there, they didn't seem to see you. I think because, you know, there was, maybe there were six or ten Spitfires amongst a hundred plus German crosses. I think they must have found it pretty hard to see us. There weren't many, many of them. I can see it all happening in front of me and I just went in last into the middle of this of his formation. I found myself um, up behind some one one O's, I think, and I opened fire on those and I was going so fast before I knew it I'd shot past that one. But I'd gone past him and down to the next lot. And uh, I had a vague shot at those and I was getting an awful lot of return fires in the middle of the spot. But I definitely hit the, the left engine and um, I can see smoke coming, but, and then I, I lose my ammunition. So the only thing you do is keep on going down and get away. All over southern England, people looked to the skies as the RAF began to fight it out. I lived, fortunately, in, in a farm cottage. Um, it was near the airfield, and I used to sit there with my knees under my chin and watch the airplanes take off when the air raid sirens went. You could sit there and watch them fighting with the enemy. 